Ladies and gentlemen, our last blood sport of the day. Oh, sorry, presentations. Welcome to the Gasta at OER24. We have five more thick <laughs> presenters today. And when we talk about what, what does open mean, being open is prepared to put yourself on the stage with Tom Farley and the crowd doing Augusta. That's what open means. So you can tweet that. <laughs> so we're going to start off our first presentation. When life brings you artificial intelligence, turn to feminism by, by the inimitable Frances Bell. I mean, we've had two amazing women here to start the day and kicking off the gossip so we have another amazing woman. So, she's not as nervous as she thought she would be, which is good. But I don't know whether she thought that would call you favor, but sadly, no. <laughs> Are we ready? Are you feeling a bit tired? Are you feeling energetic? Energetic. Now I'm watching, particularly anybody who's not sitting in the main crew, if you're not getting the hands up, I'll be watching out for this. I want participation. Hands up, everybody. Shake them out. Shake them out. You haven't been there? You're only half doing it. <laughs> a hay, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooig, gasta. Oh, no, don't forget. I'm the timer. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, right. so, no, we'll have to do that again, so. so right. <laughs> Only because it's Francis. If it was anybody else, they could sink or swim. Because I am afraid of this Favoritism. woman. No, I'm just afraid of you. <laughs> uh, we'll have to do something a bit special now. We'll have to jump you in. Set the yeah, okay. Forget about that timer. <laughs> that doesn't work. Right. That's okay. only for effect. That's lulling you into a false sense of security. That's 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes. Doesn't work. Right? Go with you. Yeah, sure, don't worry. I know. You're, in, you're such a professional. Oh, yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. A hen, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooig, gasta. When life brings you artificial intelligence, turn to feminism. This is a interest free, uh, this is a solution free zone. On a master's in the late 1980s, I studied AI and did a final project that built a classifier system, a rule based system that used genetic algorithms to generate rule sets that learn from trials in use. In contrast, some expert systems offered an explanatory interface that could justify their line of reasoning and or enable humans to learn from them. That interface was absent from genetic algorithms and Wikipedia tells us from other algorithms that can learn from data and generalize to unseen data and thus perform tasks without explicit instructions. Sounds familiar. In the 1980s, as co computing power and storage became cheaper, information systems increasingly moved from batch data processing to include relational databases that were available on demand. Shoshana Zuboff identified the concept of informating, where databases translate activities, events, and objects into data with mixed outcomes. In teaching, I use the example of the GP Harold Shipman, who changed patients' records after fatally injecting them with insulin, unaware that his edits were time and date stamped. This data provided his trial with supportive evidence of his malign actions away from the database. This was a more positive outcome of informating than many we observe in today's big tech. Currently, systems as such as ChatGPT, based on large language models, are attracting attention and usually presented as AI for reasons of hype This was, um, 
bias can be baked into databases, e.g. image recognition databases. The references document is last linked on the last slide. I suggest you start with Helen Beetham's Substack and the feminist website notmy.ai. These models extract data from various sources, not necessarily with informed consent. A new book by Mayas and Cauldry, Data Grab, The New Colonialism of Big Tech and How to Fight Back, is summarized as, your life online is their product. Their reference to fighting back supports the practice of hope rather than the shrugging of shoulders. What has feminism to offer? In the editorial for the feminist special issue of the MLT journal that some of us worked on, we outlined some work by feminists over the last 50, 30 years in education technology that is now mainstream. It was said, but not always listened to many years ago. Feminists persist, persist in engaging in critical discourse on issues such as digital surveillance, AI, and the use of metrics and data to manage academic work. Read the work of authors in this spe special issue and be encouraged for the future. Another, um, another uh, example of feminist practice that came about through the FemEdTech network was the FemEdTech Quilt of Care and Justice project launched in November 2019 and resulting in four material quilts and the digital quilts more or less in time for the online experience that rapidly replaced the cancelled OER20. The availability of FemEdTech open space and involvement in the quilt project opportunities for comfort, solidarity, and for et expressing concerns and sometimes rage at a very difficult time. Some of us explored for MedTech Quilt as a post-human assemblage in a chapter in the wonderful HE for Good book. Rosie Bradotti's post-human fe feminism is to me a promising avenue to explore. I will leave you with the last sentence of that chapter. Feminists create, feminists resist, and feminists celebrate difference. If you'd like a few, uh, 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 to share a few words with, it, with an, or without your name as a response to this gaster, please leave them in the box at the front. And now I'm going to read the paragraph that I missed. Okay. The image uh, juxtaposes digital data with an image of my crafted response to the... Um, to the, uh, the crafted response to the uh, prompt at an OER 23 com workshop led by Claire Thompson. It represents my time consuming and flawed practice of managing cookies. The green snake is my data, trying to hide in the pocket, keeping away from the fragile repair warned by the bells. I don't think Tom is going to be as kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh but fair. Now, so, um, one of my colleagues uh, here from MTU who has helped make this an absolutely amazing um, experience for the last two days. So, well done to Ruth and, <laughs> and to Jeremiah. <laughs> That's the end of me being nice, though. Right. I was going to up it a bit, so I mean, normally get the up and down a bit later, but we'll actually, we'll actually get people there, because I can see some people falling asleep. So we're going to go up on the hain, down on the dough. Are you ready? A hain! That's pathetic. <laughs> That's pathetic. Pathetic. I know it's a big word for you, Lordy. Rubbish. Are we ready? A hain! A dough. A tree! A car. A cooing! Gosta! Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name's Ruth Fox from MTU. Going straight in. Irvin et al. argue that all, one of the barriers faced by faculty to create OER stems from a perceived lack of time to devote to these activities. While you may agree or disagree with that statement, I'd like you to take some time to close your eyes and open your ears for less than a minute. 
because it's been hectic, you've been up and down, so take a minute to relax. And yes, I'm serious. Please close your eyes now and listen. Nature gifts. Take just a moment to reflect on the joy of giving. Create a talisman or a simple piece of art using natural materials and leave it for someone else to find to brighten up their day. It could be something really simple like a painted or decorated stone, a leaf with a drawing, a mandala, a written message in the sand or on a natural object, a weaving of twigs or grass or daisies. Think about how it will make this person feel when they find your gift. My offering was selfless offers priceless gifts to others. You may open your eyes now. The sound clip was created as a series of guided meditations linked to an openly licensed wellness journal and is hosted on SoundCloud. These sound files have been created for students to use as part of the wellness journal. However, however it can just as easily be used by a men's development network in Ireland, a women's shelter in South Africa, in schools in America, in corporate wellness programs, and you on your commute home. The track is less than a minute long, but how did it make you feel? An MTU colleague, Sinead Horohan, inspired me in a recent presentation when she mentioned she reuses this eight-year-old Creative Commons licensing explainer video. I'm loosely referencing in her and saying, it's a good resource, so why create a new one? She refers to it over and over again. Isn't the whole purpose of OER the ability to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute content for educational purposes? By going back and reusing OER, it frees faculty staff up to produce other OER, which in turn will help other academics. Perhaps if there were more shareable content out there, we would focus more on feedback for our students and rethink how we assess their work. Recently, the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning here at MTU supported academics in creating reusable learning resources. And I think I've said that, no. <laughs> As part of a Settle funded initiative. Something that stood out to me was the scale and complexity of some of the proposals submitted. And I can see why some academics may feel they don't have the capacity to create open education resources. That said, I was also inspired by the range of ideas and I've lost myself, and type of material that were produced by project teams for this initiative. Some of these teaching resources are made up of several smaller artifacts, and I consider the reus them reusable too, outside of each of these projects. So in a past life, I worked in an advertising agency as a graphic designer. It frustrated me that we spent hours working on ad campaigns. They went out into the world, and after the campaign was over, they became obsolete. Any ideas I could never reuse and take with me if I moved to another agency. Then I moved in to academia and I felt a sense of relief. <laughs> that as an instructional designer, any graphic design pieces I create along the way have a life beyond selling a product. The lecturers I co-design with have the autonomy to give our work a Creative Commons license and then it's out there for me or anyone else to use and not just another printed flyer occupying some landfill or slowly dying on a hard drive somewhere. How many? <laughs> open, open education resources can be so many things. Sound files, short videos, templates like the Alex Canvas I regularly use as an instructional designer. It could be an illustration, a 3D model of the body. It could be a textbook that can help students save money in the long run and help relieve the financial burden. Big, small, we'll take them all. <laughs> Consider this a call to action. On your trip home from OER, spend 30 minutes reflecting on what you can gift to the OER community. Is there something you can create in 30 minutes? Or when last have you looked at the body of work you have as a teacher or a lecturer? Is there potential for you to apply a Creative Commons license to some of your work? <gasps> Are you perhaps a minute away from retirement like Martin Weller and your teaching content will be lost the day you retire? Hey, Maybe this could be your OER gift for others three, to find out there. Can, a big, bright, beautiful can, world of open education start. resources. Let's re Let's, That's the let's grow the global community of OER resources.
<laughs> Excellent. <laughs> oh, mind the microphones. <laughs> I've been warned. <laughs> okay. I'm not allowed sharp or pointy <laughs> objects, microphones, or anything else. Is this where I so, yes. Uh, another character, or <laughs> another character. <laughs> Another colleague, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another colleague here, <laughs> Jeremiah Spillan. Jeremiah okay, so, <clears throat> right, now, um, I got you up and down, so I won't ask you to move up and down. We just go, we start off on the left, which is the Irish words clay, jazz, but I won't ask you to do that. Just, just do the count. So we're going to start off on the left. Are we ready? A hen, a doe, a tree. Am I doing the only talking here? Yeah, that was, it was bad, wasn't it? Again? It wasn't the best. A reach. I want to hear gusto. Ready? A hen, a doe, a tree, a car, a coic, gusta. So I'm just here for the sticker, really. But I haven't seen the sticker today, so I'm worried I might not get one. Okay, so, um, so in the research space in higher education, a number of challenges exist around the dissemination of new knowledge. And in this Gosta, I'm going to highlight three of those and then hopefully highlight how podcasting can address them. Uh, okay, this one. How does this work? Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so, one of the fundamental long standing issues plaguing academia, academia, variously addressed by many people over the last two days, is the relationship between higher education institutions and commercial academic publishers who, without cost, receive writing from academics, which is typically funded by the taxpayer. Then following that free labor, the publisher then sells back this research to university libraries at a substantial profit. This new knowledge typically ends up behind paywalls. Uh, all the slides. There we go, paywall. Okay, um, which is inaccessible to the very individuals who supported it and indeed funded that very research. So this for-profit commercialization of knowledge, a long-standing issue which the open access movement has long worked to address, not only restricts access, but also perpetuates wider society's barrier uh, to accessing new scholarship. Uh, so the big academic publishers are basically printing money, which is kind of the problem. So the second part of this problem uh, is that beyond the paywall, um, there are uh, additional baked-in problems. Baked in? Okay, uh, which is that academic writing and research typically operates through highly jargonized and opaque language, which is legible only to the initiated. The barrier then that I refer to in my title are those uh, operating within the, within the HE and research uh, landscape and society at large are, are these. Um, and so there's often a divide in this in terms of how we communicate our work with wider society. So the third problem, and I think this one is uh, slightly more complex, um, is Uh, so just to signpost the third issue here, which adds to the complexity of all this, are the challenges faced by early career researchers, where there are issues of prestige around research outputs and impact. So often to further their career, early, early career researchers typically have to ensure that their best work is still published via highly indexed journals um, in terms of their, uh, so early career researchers, uh, H-index. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <coughs> So yeah, so they need to make sure that their work is published in kind of highly indexed journals. Um, and so it's really important, obviously, to draw in the work of others in your field. So here's a quote from Tom Farley on the sesh last night, uh, which all, all, all jokes aside is actually a very important one. You were talking about when um, looking at job applications in higher education, uh, that they all ask for high citation and high impact, and very few of them foreground or indeed value the ethics of open. So then prestige is then the currency of our realm, and open has not yet become the marker of prestige. Open isn't an option for many, rather the luxury of those working in the space like us, or senior, more tenured academics. So my solution then, or what I'm arguing, is that podcasting offers a solution to these three problems. So firstly, sharing and making accessible research open to the wider public on the open web. Secondly, um, talking about complex ideas in simple conversational terms, make topics more accessible to a non-specialist audience. And lastly, for those early career researchers who still feel the need to publish in more closed environments for their careers, it's a way to openly share their work with a wide audience. So just a few examples, maybe kind of examples of success perhaps, um, just to kind of illustrate this. Let's see, next slide. Oh, yeah. 
So here, uh, lots of us here are, are of course podcasting, so here's an example of some of our keynotes podcasting. Um, this is another one that popped up in my feed with these handsome gentlemen here. Um, I think this is a really great example um, because Tim's colleague here is a, is a, a big uh, advocate for podcasting, and I think that's great that you know in our institutions we should engage with people that are that are podcasting and use them as kind of opportunities to share our work. So that's that's really good as well. Um, oh yeah, that's fun. Uh, Martin Weller today was talking about uh, kind of extending the life of his book um, and kind of keeping it alive through conversations about the various chapters. Again, another great example of how we can use podcasting. Um, and then a shameless plug myself, this is my own podcast, which is a musicology podcast. Um, and again, for myself, this is a great opportunity to network and have conversations with people in my, in my area that I'm interested in. Uh, so this is great. Um, uh, and another great example is the work of Michaela Benson, an English, uh, British sociologist who uses podcasting both for her research and also a way to communicate that research back to society at large, which is excellent. Um, I'm under pressure here. But uh, a really big part of this, I think, is kind of merging that scholarship with entertainment. And an excellent example of this is the work uh, Dr. Sharon Lambert, a psychologist, has done with Blind Boy, who's a podcaster in Ireland, has a really big audience. Uh, and that's kind of making uh, important hey. things. Oh, and great. Do some podcasting. Uh, if there isn't one, make one. And so, oh. Thank you. <laughs> now, so that's, it's, it's a lot of entertainment today. And actually, Jeremiah, don't forget, you're making people happy. They don't want to see the worst gossip when everybody finishes on time. So that's. No pressure, Eamon. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. We started off on the left, we're going to go on the right this time. Are you ready, Eamon? Shake them out. A hain! <laughs> do you know what? I'm not going to do the count. <laughs> you can count them in as well and encourage them. And if you think they're not, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the. I, do you know what? I'm going to say something that used to be said to me as a kid. You know, with the teacher, I can stay here all night. I can stay here all Lads, night. Lads, Tom is flagging up here. He's dying. Come on. Ready? A hay, a, a doe, a tree, a car, a cooing, Gosta. Gosta. Hello, beautiful people of OER 24. Beautiful on the outside and beautiful on the inside too. You are a good and kind a lovable person, okay? However, I don't know if you've heard of Bon Jovi and what he had to say about the current state of the pedagogical landscape. He said that your love is like bad pedagogy. Bad pedagogy is what I need. Whoa. And the reason he drew this analogy between dysfunctional and codependent human relationships and poor pedagogical practices is because he knew there is a danger that we can anthropomorphize workplaces and expect them to meet our emotional needs. The university cannot love you. Okay. Neither can your practices. Okay. And neither can the tools of your trade. Right? ChatGPT is never going to love you, okay? A fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> and you don't end up looking <laughs> you don't end up looking like a complete tool holding a foolish tool. Yeah. Why did he look at <laughs> So who who can love you? <laughs> Humans can love each other. Yeah, exactly. All right. That's true. <laughs> So I said to my students, my wonderful students in Dublin City University, I said, students, I love you. And they said, Eamon, you're being a bit weird. <laughs> I said, you didn't let me finish. I said, what I, what I, what I was going to say was, I would love to get your help in this class to look at some multiple choice questions. Because I do love MCQs. Uh, I love working on multiple choice questions. Back in 2018, myself and uh, some researchers, we looked at 214 MCQs in 18 different MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and we used a framework by Tarrant and Ware to look at the validity and the reliability of these MCQs um, 
because there is a lot of research out there, the psychometric, psychometric research and testing research that shows that if you create an MCQ badly, you'll get ins inconsistent results. And we use this framework to look at 18 item writing flaws, none of the above, all of the above, negatively worded stem, implausible distractors, ambiguous information in the question, and so on, 18 different things. Around 50% of MOOCs had flawed MCQs. So we're just creating pedagogies, bad pedagogies, and scaling them. <laughs> All right? So I said to my students, let's ask ChatGPT to create some MCQs and see if we replicate this study in class. And we did that, and we had a lot of fun. The teams worked in, uh, the students worked in teams. This is some of the slides they created. We created a lot of memes in our class, and they were looking at MCQs and analyzing them. And they did some really, really good and fun work. And it was one of the most enjoyable classes I had this year. We, ha we really had some great fun. It was really good. Um, so the future is not what it used to be, right? Uh, because there's guardrails to protect us from harms and biases and all this. But there's no guardrails that are going to protect us from just shoddy educational resources that this stuff is going to generate. So the future is going to be very mundane. We'll be working to clean up a lot of the mess that AI generates. Um, and we need to be careful not to install guardrails in the human heart. Okay. The border patrols others have imposed on us and the monitoring systems you may have installed yourself, as Rua Benjamin put it very well. So I hope you remember what I said a few minutes ago. Did you not learn anything from this talk? ChatGPT cannot love you, okay? So instead, you can join a non-violent and loving police force dedicated to finding, arresting, but not incarcerating, but reforming and rehabilitating bad pedagogies. Thank you. <laughs>26 seconds to spare. That was impressive. Last but certainly not least. Alan's thinking, what the hell do I have to do to follow that? But I have no doubt that Alan and I will, will I, think, I think he'll certainly do something. Now, we just, I wanted to keep it for the last gasta of the last, whatever, the sessions. So we just done one clap. But we'll go back now and we'll do the full, proper double clap. So it'll be... Pain. Is that okay? We all got that? Get the hands up. Now I want gusto. This is your last gasta for the year. Are we ready? ready. Go. Pain. <laughs> Do. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Car. <laughs> Keurig. <laughs> gasta. Thank you, Corey. Before the poetry commences, Internet Tone News sets the stage with an abbreviated, opinionated history. Present digital capabilities are founded on network diagrams made by wizards who stayed up late. Cold War mindsetting, a packet switching system, distributed, decentralized, communal, unbreakable. 35 years ago, it enabled a vague but exciting proposal to birth the web bubbles. Tim Berners-Lee's three C's, collaboration, fostering compassion, and generating curious creativity, and of all things, a silly avian-themed text box to literally broadcast what you had for lunch. For educators especially, but society in general, was this one internet town hall? Hashtagging revolutions. The hashtag is the course. Our PD networked. It was the best of times. But was that an illusion? came ads, algorithms, influencers, fraud, abuse, crypto scams, right for plucking as a billionaire's ego toy, plundering the API, deep sixing the precious Twitter tags created by Martin Hoxie. This is a fine dumpster fire, isn't it? A social media diaspora. There are now sentient content consuming machines roaming wild. Power and influence is concentrated rather than distributed. Welcome to the Enchido scene. <laughs> Yet, at its worst, all of this is riding on that original diagram concept, a distributed network. 
So where the hell do we go? Where do we go? Where, where are you going? Where, where, where do we go? There's no one place to go, is there? And now, with some license. There's no magic one place, no town hall. I summon you to seek that DNA of the internet itself, a schematic with no center, no control, whose propellant is cooperation. What is, where is the Fediverse? It's here now. I feel it. It's distributed, decentralized, communal, shared, not owned, co-ops, not biz ops, where accessibility is not a sideshow, where the means of communication is universal. With RSS, with an API, no one will close or put behind a paywall. It's a network of independent networks. It's like those navigation maps of old, which transmit to each other by activity pub. One protocol, one protocol to share them all. And not just for status posts, but for intersharing photos, videos, links, music, podcasts, book reviews, writing. It's Mastodon, but more. It's Pixel Fed, PeerTube, Lemmy, Funk Whale, Castapod, Bookworm, Write Freely. Your WordPress, it becomes part of this activity hub. And it's all able to communicate with each other. But it's complicated. It's confusing. So is love. So is poetry. So is learning. That's opportunity. So if my name has two at signs in it, it means I'm not beholden to an own place. I am free to move. The places you have set up camp, who owns, what owns them, operates them, moderates, cares, tends to its community. What are their interests? What is the trajectory of their maps? So assert your options. Do not be owned, managed, tangled, influenced, sucked into the easy offers slid between ads to you. Platforms do not define us. We supersede them. The Catherine Cronins, the Martin Wellers, the Francis Bells. We sense their humanness, their presence, wherever we see them, right? We are more. So I'm suggesting, no, I'm calling, I'm appealing to your appreciation for that core diagram characteristic of the original internet. Silently, always, a life-giving pulse, bum, bum, living beneath. Beware of egotistical billionaires, extractors, faceless entities, datifying your acts. Here is your detour. Come on, it's time to escape the algorithm. Do not settle, do not line up just where it's easy. Do not become a thread, do not settle, do not become a commodity. Stand up, come on, stand up. When they want to count you down, when they hey, want to put you off the stage, three, get federated, four, get federated. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. Jim Groom, Jim who? <laughs> okay, can the, can the gustateurs please come up and get their badges, please? This is what... This is what gas is all about. Actually, it is. It's about having the crack. It's about love. We've heard that word also. Come on up here. You've well deserved this. As I said. <laughs> as I said, anybody, anybody can be a presenter. It takes real openness to be a gossetier. Beer mats, not coasters. <laughs> it's Crossing the stage, yeah, it's like a sort of mini graduation. It's got a bizarre graduation. It's not high. I'll go. Thank you. Oop, oop. Here. Here. Badges. Oh, look at that. Thank you so much, Tom. It was fun. Who needs boring speeches when you can finish off a conference like that? Uh, I'm looking for Garode, if you want to make your way on up here. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, well, I hope Jim Groom was watching that. I hope Jim Groom was watching that live because he's just lost his slot for next year. He's going to have to do an audition to get a, a place back at Gosta. Anyway. Okay, let, let's let's bring things to uh, to a close. I have a few notes here. We do a two-hander on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I will say, having worked so long to prepare for the conference, it's almost a surprise to find that it's over, over. now <laughs> at this stage. You know, I I, I must say. And really, I don't have any grand closing no. remarks or anything like that. I think we just wanted to make sure that we're thanking all of the people who are uh, responsible for the, yeah. for the event, really. So in a kind of chronological order, uh, I wanted to thank Marin Deepwell for encouraging us um, to submit a bid to, to host the conference in the first place. I want to thank my co-chair for insisting that we follow <laughs> advice in, in putting in that bid. Uh, thanks to Alt, uh, who, while navigating their own yeah. processes of change, helped us to navigate through the various different stages of preparation uh, for the conference. To the organising committee, yep, who gave so freely of their time. To Donna and Laurie, who just left the building, um, for their... Um, uh, early video there encouraging people to submit for the conference that was really great and hit the, yeah, hit it, the it's, tone it's really nice well tone, yeah. uh, to Shane for over there for so many things for the digital marketing <laughs> and um, later for for organizing and managing the AV side of things that's definitely no small task to Ty Glean who's just over there our operations manager who, uh, Ty Glean made us look good. He did, he did. And, 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 that, that, was, takes, and, that, and that was no small task. That was task, no small task, really, task yeah. no. <laughs> so definitely kept the trains running on time and kept me running on time, kept, kept us running on time. Um, yep. To the sponsors, to the speakers, to the session chairs, to the keynotes, to the staff here in the MTU arena who are taking up carpet as we speak. Um, and that's not a euphemism or anything. Um, to volunteers from the Entutor project yeah, yeah. and to staff from the Department of Technology yeah. Enhanced Learning, who in addition, in many cases, to supporting the conference, found time to give presentations, yeah. to do GASTAs just now, and in one case to do a workshop. So folks, I must say, your work has always been top rate, but often invisible, as is often the case um, with people who are, who are providing that kind of support. So it's been a, a pleasure to be able to, to unconceal yeah. and reveal your professionalism and dedication here at OER24. I think you've, you've really done the uh, department and, and the university yeah. proud, so we might have a, yeah. might have a round of applause there. Yeah. No, it's, look, it's a chance for us to... As a university, we're only three and a bit years old, and I think it's, it's a chance for us all to put our, our best foot forward and, and to show, and I think, you know, the university and the staff have really helped out and stuff there like that, and I think, hopefully, if this is not your first OER, you know what it's like, but a lot of people here, it's their first OER, and I've been ranting for months about OER special. I hope people who, this is your first OER, you see it, you're with people who genuinely care about the things that matter so hopefully you got that so. absolutely so look it's been a pleasure welcoming and hosting you all thanks for coming you're genuinely back anytime not tomorrow maybe but any <laughs> any, any other time um and look we're really interested in collaborating and continuing the conversations yes. with you thanks for your energy and your ideas and your commitment uh, don't be a stranger as they say thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you. Yep. So we're, we're not quite finished yet, actually. There's one last announcement, and who better to give us than Rajiv? Well, uh, valediction, I, whatever <laughs> word. I, I can't, I'm so tired, I can't think of big words anymore. Well, the way this was explained to me was I was invited to roast somebody, but I can, I can switch. So <laughs> Knock yourself out. Martin Willa. You, my friend, are the consummate digital scholar, 
you've battled for open, you've relayed the history of ed tech, and while also indulging in your only mildly disturbing fetish for metaphors. <laughs> your scholarship was, of course, staggering. Uh, I will say it's been deeply, deeply influential to so many for so long. But I will say, coming to open, many of us feel, and I see the same reaction in many young scholars, whether you're coming from psychology like me or others, people often tell me, People are different and open. They don't find the same degree of arrogance, the same degree of hierarchy, a lot of openness, a lot of generosity. And for me, you certainly have exemplified that um, for a very long time. I will say your dedication to building community, your mentorship in particular for the next generation of scholars and your commitment to building a sustainable model for mentorship has been incredible. But I'll share a few personal things since we're approaching this exciting milestone uh, in your life. I've learned several interesting things about, Ma about Martin over the years. Many of them have been inspiring. Your love of hockey. Our complementary sympathies for each other, myself living in Canada, who loves cricket, you living in, uh, in Cardiff with your love for hockey. We seem like we were on different sides of the wormhole for a while. Your love for the Chicago Blackhawks. Your shining pride for your daughter with every post. Many special memories, I'll share three of them with, with all of you. The first was the very first time I met Martin, which was at a conference that he was keynoting alongside other luminaries. And we found ourselves um, in a strange place. The conference was in Sun City, which is an awkward place in many ways, uh, but we found a bit of an oasis, a place where the staff were meeting and where we were eating the local food. We were enjoying bunny chow, playing pool, this was alongside Tracy McMillan Cotton and Audrey Waters and Brian Lamb and of course Owen DeVries getting to know Martin for the first time. My second favorite memory of you is when we were at the Creative Commons Summit in Toronto and we decided to go to a Blue Jays game. Alan, you were there too, I think. Um, and again, Martin and I, not really understanding what was happening with the slow pace of this game, decided we would amuse ourselves by relaying cricket commentary for the entire baseball game, <laughs> live tweeting it as we went which is fantastic. But my third favorite memory of you is maybe the most, uh, most emblematic of, I think, your nature. And it's when I came to London in 2017 for this conference. And it was just after my first edited book had been published from the publisher who was Martin's previous publisher, which is how I discovered them. And Martin not only met me at a pub to celebrate this exciting moment in my own career, but he physically walked to the publisher's offices, picked up the very first copy that had been printed, brought it to the pub for us to celebrate. And I share that with you just as an example of how sweet this man is. Many of you know that his book, 25 Years of Ed Tech, of course, there was a lot of work that followed. Clint Lalonde had a lot of work to pull together, a lot of people to, to create an audiobook version of each of the chapters. And, it was a great privilege to be asked to, to read one of those chapters. Um, but I will say, Martin, I hope you realize that people wouldn't do that for just anybody. That was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but they would do it for somebody who does it all for others. Absolutely. I often tell people, I tell my students, I would much prefer to have kindness in somebody over cleverness. You, my friend, are incredibly clever and you are exceptionally kind. Now that you're freed up from all of the trouble that you were causing at the OEU, or soon to be, I look forward to seeing what mischief you get up to uh, in the remaining uh, years of the fun we're gonna have together, certainly. So congratulations, my friend. I'm very excited to celebrate this huge moment in your life and I'm excited for all of the joy you're gonna continue to bring all of us. Bless you. That was like uh, when Joseph Stalin used to speak, everybody was afraid to be the first one to stop clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, would you like to? <laughs> We're way ahead of time. So I've uh, been to 11 OER conferences in a row, and I'm going to take you through each one, every presentation. <laughs> um, I have to say, they've all been sunny, except this one. 
Tom, you need to work on your weather here. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> this is the part where I reveal, in fact, it's going to be like the end of Scooby-Doo. I pull off a mask, and actually, I've been an undercover agent for Pearson all this time. <laughs> and I, I would have got away with it if it wasn't for you pesky open kids. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I'm so pleased that, for those who don't know, I'm leaving the Open University so, uh, and uh, standing down from GoGen. So um, I couldn't ask for a better conference. As Tom said right at the start, you know, uh, the OER conference is a very special community. And when I co-chaired it in 2015, it had been run as part of the JISC OER community before then. And uh, Marin approached me um, and said, you know, would you consider Alt taking it over? And there was actually really strong resistance to that. And most people were like, oh, no, it's, no, don't let Alt take over, they're evil. Don't, don't, don't trust Marin. You know, um, <coughs> and, I, and we really pushed for it. And I think, you know, if we, if we hadn't done that, the conference wouldn't exist uh, still. And I think since under Alt stewardship, it's kind of become a really conference with its own identity. It's become much more international, much more critical. It's moved away from talking about OER as stuff to much more about practice and all those kind of things. And it really is the kind of, I'm not just saying this, it really is my favourite conference and it's a favourite group of people. So uh, thank you for uh, letting me come up here and ramble on. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Gary. Right. <laughs> We've seen the parking glass. <laughs> of all the money that I spent, I spent it in good company. And of all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. For all I want, for want of wit, the memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Slug. Yes. Yeah.